Righto. Uh, the MRO, the match review office. So it was, it was always going to blow up this weekend and blow up it did by the close of business yesterday. So all told, we've got three players copping three game bans at this stage, Kane. We've got another with a one match suspension and a stack of fines. So let's just acknowledge and park. I think we can both do this together. We can agree on this. Alex Davies, the front. I mean, that's 101, isn't it? Front on contact. Well, on Lockie I, yeah. Jones. So I thought if the, and there's been a bit of talk about a send off rule and Jared's been big on this. So I worked with him the other afternoon if there's ever a case for a send-off rule that was it I think that's the most one of the most if not the most dangerous things you can do in football is when a player's got their head over the footy and you come in like the old school yeah. sort of Byron Pickett Michael Long style and risk a significant neck injury so he he's really lucky to only um, be suspended for three games there and if you're gonna have a send-off rule I think that absolutely qualifies for that so that one no issue with tick did it well. Would have liked to have seen that at, at four matches and not three. But we'll move on to the others, which are which are quite divisive. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and that, for the record, was careless, severe, and high. So severe because he was concussed. We've got our heads around that. Okay, Toby Bedford's tackle on Tim Taranto. Charlie Cameron's on Liam Duggan. So both of them given three-match suspensions. And both saw the Giants, I think this is relatively rare, Came within, I reckon, 60 to 90 minutes, GWS and Brisbane both announced their intention to take both of these cases to the tribunal. Normally, you would have to wait until uh, this morning to get answers out of the clubs on that. Did Toby Bedford tackle on um, Tim Taranto, and does he have a case to answer? No, uh, he'll, he'll get off. We're, we're in all sorts of trouble. If that action leads he'll get off? to, yeah, absolutely, he'll get really? off. He, he, that taint, the tackle was far less dangerous than what Patrick Dangerfield did to Sam Walsh. Now I know Sam Walsh wasn't concussed, but that's luck of the draw. Like there's every reason in a different situation where Sam Walsh is concussed in that Dangerfield tackle. Now he got he got one because the impact was less because he wasn't concussed. What I'm interested in in looking at because. Dangerfield was so compelling in his evidence and because he understands the way to defend himself and he's got great conviction in what he did, will other players, and I said this at the time, will other players be as confident? And I sort of use the example of a first year, Justin Westhoff, who was the shyest player that I've ever played with and would have hated going up there and trying to do that. Will Bedford and, and Charlie Cameron be able to get up there and do what Patrick Dangerfield did and defend himself as well as he did. And should we be in a situation where players are let off because their evidence is more compelling than another player's? But I can't see there's a way that the Giants won't get him off. Now, it's really important because they play the Suns this week, they play Melbourne, then they play Hawthorne. Bedford's become a pivotal player through that midfield now and plays a vital role. We cannot have a situation in our game where that tackle, which he couldn't have done anything differently leads to a three-match suspension. I don't know one person, not one, and, and tell me if, if you're one of them or tell me if there's one listening that believes that tackle deserves three games. Well, I thought the least surprising thing was that he was given three games because Michael Christian's only got the boxes that he can tick. Now, the difference with... Was it with careless, the... though? Well, that, that, he, he, did he have to say that was careless? Or well, both he... arms are pinned and a player's been concussed. Well, yeah. so it's straight up and well, down. Where's there, where's there a rule that's ever been that you're not allowed to pin both arms? No, both. It's written into the rule book. You're, not, R- allowed, rough, you're, you're rough, not allowed to be, pin both arms in rough, a tackle. Rough conduct, dangerous tackles, both arms pinned is one of the triggers. But, and the fact that he's been... it wasn't conca- rough conduct. It was a tackle. Uh, but, yeah, which no, but, is a, it was a legal tackle that is allowed in this game. That is described as a player being in a vulnerable position. This, this is written into the guidelines of the tribunal. He's got the footy. So when both arms are pinned and a player's head hits the ground and he is concussed, I, th- I thought that was the least surprising thing so about it. So you're comfortable it. with this? You're no, no. comfortable with the player missing three games for that tackle? No. So what I'm going to say is the least surprising thing is that he's been cited. The second most su- least surprising thing is the fact that the Giants challenged it straight away. And I think this is the process. Like We shouldn't be looking at the MRO for this because I think the difference between Dangerfield and, and this tackle is that the player was concussed. Yeah. Sam Walsh so wasn't is that, concussed. Is that right, though? Well... People argue that too much is given to outcome rather than intent, and maybe there's something in that as well. We'll get come back to that because I want to talk about Malcolm Roses as well, which speaks to intent versus outcome. But can Toby Bedford articulate his defence as well as Dangerfield, well, like you touch on? Because at the time when Patrick Dangerfield's one-match sanction, and he was suspended, was overturned, the tribunal came out and said... It will be a rare, even exceptional case where a player who tackles with significant forward motion, who pins both arms and who could have, but does not release one or both arms will not have engaged in rough conduct. This is such a case. So they 
spent a lot of time in that case talking about how Patrick Dangerfield, you know, remember he pulled Sam Walsh back mm. or he was seen to put his legs forward and swing him back. Does does this happen with the Toby Bedford one? Again, he's got a concussed player on his hands where Patrick Dangerfield didn't. I, I think he might struggle. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I think what we've seen go before us before, what we know, I think he's going to struggle to get it overturned. Oh, so, well, this is well, – we're, we're in big trouble. Well, maybe. As a game because – and I've said this a couple of times. Now, Chris Scott said just there that uh, you've got to make sure that there's no head contact in any circumstance. Well – I wonder if Chris thinks that driving a knee into the head of an opponent is okay. So if we, you can't, you just can't get rid of all head contact. You can't, and 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 then you start to slowly chip away at what we love about the footy. So you get rid of the tackle, which is now gone. It's it's absolutely gone because Bedford can't lay a legal tackle. You get rid of the you know, the shepherd's gone. The smother is on its way out if you cause injury. To that, the bump is gone. But, but uh, you players slowly, are lining uh, up to sue the competition. Like, sl- but, but, but well, don't play. Like honestly, like there there has to be. But they want people to play. Well, this is the thing. Well, well, it's not going to be the game that we like. It's not going to be a game that you want to watch. Otherwise, make it flag football or make it touch or whatever it is, because that is the ideal tackle. It is perfect. It wasn't dangerous. It absolutely wasn't careless. So mm. you see, did Michael Christian have another option? Of course he did. You can say that wasn't a careless tackle. That was a legal, perfect, no, perfectly he executed tackle. It's written tackle. in, the, I'll read it out verbatim here. Rough conduct. Three, rough conduct in brackets, dangerous tackle. Among many of the triggers. The player being tackled is in a vulnerable position, e.g. arms pinned with little opportunity to protect himself. So that's what Michael Christian's dealing with. And the player was concussed. And well, he had to send it up. Now, whether he gets suspended or not, we, we can debate. And that, that's the good thing about the tribunal is that they'll go in. He'll argue his case. He'll defend himself. They'll defend it for him, the Giants, with, with their legal counsel. And, and then it's up to Jeff Gleeson and the tribunal to, to decide. And maybe there's nothing wrong with that. Does anyone think... Toby Bedford deserves three games for that tackle. one 736 736 I want to hear from you. And, and then we can flow on to, to Charlie Cameron, right. which, well, I, which I think is in a, in a similar boat. Before we get to Charlie, the, the one thing I really struggle with, with these sort of things, and you're talking about outcome versus intent, is how Malcolm Roses can get two weeks less suspension for elbowing Logan Evans off the ball, just because he's not concussed. And he's only got good fortune to thank for that. This is a off-the-ball, cheap shot, high, completely intentional. And and yet he gets one, and a player executing a tackle or trying to gets three. Mm. That's There's something fundamentally you know, wrong in the system. You know what I also struggle with? That there's four umpires out there. No free kick. And they can see a player run past someone on the mark. What are you looking at? And he elbows him to the head, and not one of the four umpires on the ground have got, oh, you know what? You're probably not allowed to do that in the rules. So, yeah, no, I'm with you on that. How can an off-the-ball strike, well, uh, what, even if low impact, be given one? Like, just start all off-the-ball strikes now, three weeks minimum. An elbow, if you, an elbow to the head. If you're going to punch or elbow or even if you just glance, if you're taking the conscious decision to belt to try to belt someone off the ball uh, intentionally like that, where the ball's nowhere near it, it's not a footy act, then start at three and work up from there. Mm. Well, I, I hope the tribunal will do the right thing. And what a waste of what a waste of time. Certain he'll get off. I'm absolutely certain that Toby Bedford and Cameron will get off. And what a waste of time that is. And what a shocking system it is when that happens. And we speak about it for, for days because of this. Cameron on Duggan. So careless, severe and high. Same trigger for a three-match suspension. Is the drive excessive? Like, did it need to happen? Did he need to force well, him I just all the that, way back? Uh, actually, um, might be AFL 360, just the replay on right now. I just watched it again. I reckon it's Duggan himself who's trying to break yeah, the tackle. There's that, a bit in that, the, maybe. The, the, it's his force that takes mm. him to ground. Nothing to do with Charlie Cameron. So, Duggan, Duggan would have... I don't know, 12 kilos on Charlie Cameron, perhaps more. It was his force that led that tackle to the ground and, and nothing to do with Charlie Cameron, who in that instance is allowed to tackle and the momentum of Duggan has driven himself into the ground. Nothing to do with Charlie Cameron. Ridic- yeah. Ridiculous. So I just want to hear the evidence in both of them. Like, did that, Like, did Charlie Cameron exercise his duty of care? And that'll be the same question to Toby Bedford um, as well, both given three match suspensions. Not a great weekend for the Port Adelaide Football Club going down to the Gold Coast Suns. And a player was, was um, separated, I reckon, to a large degree from the rest. And not for the first time. His name is Jason Horn Francis Kane. And... Someone you're uh, a big supporter of, as are many, of course. Uh, nine disposals, did kick the two goals, gave away four free kicks 
And uh, a lot of those free kicks due to ill temperament. Clearly, Gold Coast had got under his skin and uh, they've seen something there, as other clubs have. He was spoken to on the bench by Ken Hinckley, who was, I think, pretty forthcoming in the post-match press conference as well about we're not accepting that that is okay, but that this is a work in progress for Jason. Uh, obviously, undoubted talent, but some learning along the way when opposition um, players identify something and they go after it. So this was David King, your Fireball Friday running mate. On first crack, I wanted to play this for you. And this bloke, they've got a problem. They've got a problem that they haven't wanted to really talk about for a little while. Have they got a problem? I, look, I haven't seen that often this year. I think that's uh, a little bit of an overreaction. I mean, it was... It was on Wednesday, I think, that, that Kingy was really complimentary of him and how important he was and the role that, that he should be playing. So he's you know, top 15 in coaches' votes. He's 21 years of age. Has he got a temper? Is he gettable? Yep, I, I agree with that. Um, is it something that they clearly need to be aware of? Yes. Do his teammates, do the leaders, do the captain need to be aware of that on field as well and sense when that frustration is boiling over and pull him back into line and have those conversations with him in real time before it spills over, Ab absolutely. And he, and I, as I said yesterday and, and last night on Footy Classified, in that moment he let himself down and his team down, and he now has a target on his back, like Tom Stewart. Like Tom Stewart has a target on his back, who's probably, well, he's 31 years of age, Tom Stewart, or 30, he's a five-time All-Australian, and he's gettable. So it's something that Tom has to work on as 30 year. Is It's something that... Harley Reid has to work on, who was fined again on the weekend, who's been suspended for two weeks after he was tagged. Yep, he's a little bit younger than, than Horn Francis, but that will be in the mix for um, Harley Reid. The same for Zach Butters. The same for Toby Green, who at 21 years of age is a completely different product than what Toby Green is right now. And it probably took Toby, I don't know, to the age of 26, 27. So you hope it doesn't take that long. But give me someone who is tough. Give me someone who wants to win. Give me someone who at the age of 20, 21 has dragged his team over the line and probably won seven or eight games off his own boot in a short career over someone who doesn't have that competitive spirit. So I think it's, a, I think it's an interesting conversation. I think the coaching was really good on the weekend to get him off the ground and calm it. Yeah. But he's got, yeah, absolutely he's got to be better. But Ken suggested, uh, oh, this might be different from the other players that you've mentioned, that he seeks that physical contact. And then once you open Pandora's box in that regard, then you've got to be expecting that the opposition are going to come after you. So does he need to temper that? He gave six free kicks away the week prior against the Western Bulldogs as well. Does he need to pull back on, on that side of it? The push yeah, and shove yeah, and all the... Yeah, I think, I think the push and shove, absolutely. But I think some of the free kicks that he's given away, and you'd have to look at a breakdown, yeah. uh, some of them are he's actually won the football and he's been gang tackled. He hasn't been able to dispose of yeah. it, trying to make things. So he's holding the ball. Are we gonna? Are we gonna want him to get the the holding the ball against free kicks out of his game? Well, no, because then you're gonna uh, discourage him from taking the game on and and one of his his great weapons. I'm I'm I am worried about the um, your team's got the footy and you reverse it and you give away a free kick in that situation or the 50 meter penalty that leads to a goal. Absolutely, that is unacceptable and can't be accepted. But. You, you, and 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 Kingy says everyone loves Jason. No, 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 they don't. He's got the biggest target on his back from a media sense. Uh, Kingy, you know, goes pretty hard on him and has in the past, and I understand why opposition supporters do. He's had to put up with being booed since he's 19 years of age. So not not everyone loves Horn Francis. So that that's that's not accurate. Um, and there is definitely a target on his back from from media, from opposition fans, and from opposition clubs, and that's fine. That's what you have got to put up with. But you watch, in, in three or four years' time, this guy is going to be absolutely frightening. Adam, Sicily went through at 2K. Now he's a captain at Hawthorne. And this one, all great players had an edge. Jason Orr Francis is a future Hall of Famer. Would love him at the Blues. But that's all in the future for the here and now. How big of a test is it for a young captain? Like, Connor Rosie's not that much older than Jason. They're, what, two, three years yeah. probably? Does he have? So does Connor Rosie have the hard edge that I think you need? Yeah, as to a sit him down. And, and and with Zach Butters as well, who's had his moments yeah, this even, year. Yeah, even Zach, I thought some of his body language on the weekend, you know, I, I, look, I don't mind the demanding of your teammates, but when it becomes demonstrative, I think that yeah, can be distracting. So the, the counter question to that is if it's not Connor Rosie, what other options did Port Adelaide have as the captain of the club? None, mm. No one. Mm. So, I mean, he, he will grow into that role. Um, even I think you're seeing what Patrick Cripps has become now versus what even Cripps was three or four years ago as a captain. 
um, is a, a completely different product. So, look, I, I think it's definitely a, an interesting discussion. There's no doubt you can't accept those efforts like the footy club wouldn't, and he's got to be better. But but give me someone with that will to win over other attributes, and I'll take that every day. Are mm. you going to answer my Ginevan question? Or yeah. What? So, Lockie Schultz, you spoke about him last night compared to Ginevan. So, at the moment, it was 34. That's done. And it was a future first-round pick that Collingwood gave up. Now, as it stands, that's pick seven. A lot more than the Pies ever envisaged they would be giving up. The, they clearly want pick seven. The, the problem is that you brought up last night the comparisons between Jack Inovan and Lockie Schultz from a football Where's perspective. Where's the problem? Because it wasn't a football decision from Collingwood to, to trade Jack Inovan. I mean, his exit meeting, he was told, his version of events, that he wasn't humble by the coach. Mm. Very pointed. Mm. And once Craig McRae said that to him, he knew he was in he was in trouble. So is that mismanagement of the highest order? Well, he went out to the races the night before the grand final. Now, I remember asking Craig Kelly about this outside the MCG on crunch time bef- uh, two hours before the bounce. And Craig said, ask Media muckraking. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, Players you, have got I, I, I remember hearing him on air. Yeah, that pre, was on air. Pre-grand final. Yes, yeah. it was on crunch time. But as uh, as soon as the game finished, it became clear that uh, that angered the coach and some players. Darcy Moore said he couldn't believe it when he found out. That certainly wasn't a decision he would have made. And Craig McRae asked him to read the room. So he was traded not for football reasons. He was traded okay. because... Yeah. The lifestyle. So they, that, got, so they got that wrong. Of all of all the misdemeanors Collingwood players have done over the years, over a long period of time, and it's a different regime now, I get it, and they've been willing to turn a blind eye or to work with the player to get them better because they see the potential in their football. That was a decision to trade him and then mm. give up a future first round pick, which of course they didn't envisage missing the finals this year, which is now seven. Yeah. You've got a 22-year-old playing the exact same role as a 27-year-old with basically equal numbers. Some some Schultz is better, as I said on Footy Classified last night, but largely Ginevan is providing exactly what Schultz is doing, and you've given pick seven away. When you're looking at it right now, unless something changes significantly, and, and I'll put my hand up, at the time I was supportive of the trade for Schultz. I thought he'd be an excellent addition, but it's nothing but a, it's nothing but a disaster from a trade perspective. And, yeah. they, and they've and and Hawthorne have allowed Ginevan to play with the freedom that Collingwood didn't allow, and I don't see any issues with his behaviour. No, well, Collingwood so, are so, privy to so, all the information, so, aren't they? How, if, how can Hawthorne get him in line and and were Collingwood too quick to give up on a, well, maybe, a second year player who would kick forty one goals for a year and yep had a down year last year and had some issues, but. They've wiped their hands of him pretty quickly. and I don't Maybe know. being traded is a shot across the bow that a player needs to snap out of it, though. And I, I think Collingwood are privy to all the information. And it wasn't just that. There's other things, as we know. Some made the headlines, some didn't with him. You, but I think if, if you're you making be- your decisions for culture, then you don't make any apologies. If, you, if you're thinking you're making the right decision for your culture, aside from what happens between in, inside the boundary line, then you've got to stick to that. It's early days. I'm sure Lockie mm. Schultz will, will come good. He was always going to be in the crosshairs if Collingwood had a poor season. And no one could have envisaged they'd be sitting 12th. No, but I think you've got eight to, months you've, after you've, winning you've, the you've grand final. Factor that in any time you trade future picks. Some have worked in favour of clubs. Some have been nothing but mm. disastrous. But when you look at it, the cold hard light of day, you've given pick seven and Ginevan for Schultz. And that, really, could they have could they have asked for more when it comes to Jack Inovan? But I mean, these are the things that when when other clubs know that you're keen to get rid of a player, you can't then ask for a, for a king's ransom as well. And we know how hard it was for them to yank uh, Lockie Schultz out of out of Fremantle. So mm. um, yeah, I mean Lockie's got a part to play in it as well. He's got yep. to lift his own own form going forward. But I don't think it was a footy conversation that one. They're coming into bat pretty hard for Lockie Schultz, and geez, haven't they wiped their hands with Jack Inovan? Guinea played for self, not team. Schultz's pressure is what Collingwood wanted. Um, and there's a lot of other texts coming through here. Look at Corn. Look at Ginnivan's shocking performance in the grand final. He shots a goal and dreadful kick from the centre at a crucial moment in the last quarter. Matt from Williamstown, and they just come one after the yeah, other. Yeah, and, and, and look, I still think he's... I'm not riding Lockie Schultz off, but when you look at a list management decision, when you go through Collingwood's state of affairs with the lack of young talent coming through and how reliant they are still on players well and truly above the age of 30, and you've got to prize pick and and this of course this may change but right now it's seven it, it could become less if Collingwood fall away this season with the draw that they've got and you may end up giving a top five pick for a player who's playing the same role who is five years younger and a top 10 pick for that I, I think even 
the most passionate Collingwood fan would go, that is a disastrous trade that we've made. Paul, disaster is a ridiculous overreacting statement. Kane Ginnivan was a toxic influence at the club. Schultz is a far so better take, so, so take Ginnivan out of it. Is pick seven for Schultz a disaster? So even even when you've got the same player who's I think if, uh, the same role. I think role, if Lockie Schultz's current form continues over the course of the next 12 to 24 months, then yeah, I'm saying it's a disaster. Yeah, and that's that's. But at the moment in a team that's factor. got a, a much wider set of problems at the moment than just Lockie Schultz, and I'm willing to say let's just hold fire for a second and see if he can turn it all around, which I think he can because like you articulated earlier, when the trade was done, we thought what a brilliant pickup. This guy's going to be a great acquisition for Collingwood. Now, Two things. We never thought pick seven was going to be the trade. That yep. might well not be. I mean, the season's not over. There's six rounds to go. The way this season's gone, Collingwood could finish the season fifth for all we know, and it'd be totally different. I've got lots of things I want to talk to you about right. this morning. I'm sitting, sitting on a few things. Come on, then. We've, with player movement and how aggressive clubs are being mid-year to try and get some people, and your your story on Sam Mitchell is, is fascinating, the, the, the communication with, with Battle and, and Perryman and others, and they're into Bailey Smith. And um, Mackey was asked about this. Andrew Mackey was asked about this on 3RW, I think, about what, what's what's the rules? It, are, are we in a situation now where this is going to become just a complete free-for-all? There are no rules, as long as you, but you should, can't sign so, a bond. So that, that, that's the question. Should there be rules? Because, or, or as we get so competitive and the fight for signatures, and not many signatures, not many players that are going to move, where we're going to have coaches flying all over the country mid-year, to meet with contracted players for other clubs. Does the AFL need to crack down on this? What, so you're not allowed to talk to another player? And he, well, I'm not sure whether I think maybe all, com- all communication goes through management. Come on. What's, what, so what is it? Come on. We're not, talking about mid-season trade not, periods and we, not we're not even allowing... Are you concerned that this is going to be a free-for-all where Shea, Shea Bolton, if I'm a Richmond fan and he's meeting with Richmond mid-year, I'm going, I'm not, I don't know about this. Clubs are fine with it because they're all doing it. They're all doing it. They're doing it to other clubs and it's being done to them. Should they be allowed to do this? Yeah. Why shouldn't they be allowed to talk to another player? As long as no binding contracts are Because Shea Bolton's got four years to go at Richmond and you've got another club trying to prime out of that. You follow American sports. I I, I do. This shocks me, this take. No, I do. But they've got got strict rules. You love your American sports. Yeah, I know. And they've got strict rules around when and and, and when you can't. Tapping up. Speak to players. And there are significant punishments if you step outside those parameters. It's like prohibition though. It'll always happen. It'll always happen. Conversations will always be. I reckon it's just starting to get a little bit messy and murky. Coaches taking on a more hands-on role. Yeah, I think it it is a real thing. While it might have happened in the past, and Alistair Clarkson famous for flying, I reckon a lot of those things were done late in the season or more accurately in the off-season for them to be happening right throughout a, a current campaign where, you know, just pluck a name out. Sam Mitchell is coaching Hawthorne on a Friday night, but that morning he's yeah. having and, a coffee with Josh and Battle. And don't get me wrong. I, I love the clubs that are doing it. And if your club isn't doing it, I'm going, why aren't we yeah. in this? You've got to be in the fight. I think you need to take a bit of that power away from clubs and the AFL. I know they've got a lot on their plate at the moment, but I just think there needs to be a, a cleaner process. It's getting messy. It's getting murky. We've got four year uh, contracted players meeting with rival clubs mid year when they should be focusing on their own form and that of their club. What, yeah. So no talking pre-July oh, oh, then? Well, if you've, got a, if you've got a contract for four years and in the mid-season break, you're in Perth speaking to Frio, I'm not sure that's a great look. An open question to you and, and everyone this morning, Kane. Who are the most fair weather fans out there? <laughs> who are those who oh, just change with the wind? Don't get me in trouble. Now, those who uh, flock and come from everywhere to watch their side when they know they're going to win. And then those who just say, what football club when they can't win a game? Now, 19,000 at the weekend for a Richmond home game in Melbourne. 19,000, Kane. That, for the record, actually, that's their lowest home crowd for a game at the G or in Melbourne since 2004, 20 years ago. This team, speaking of dynasties, they had one not that long ago. They got 105,000 members. They get 19,000 there. And I saw a bit of orange in the crowd as well. So let's say it's 16,000 Richmond supporters rocked up out of a membership base of 105,000. Yellow and black. Again, we're from... Yeah, like, look, it's, it's embarrassing. What and happened? I'm on their website right now, and it, it says the current membership tally is 96,270. If you are a Richmond supporter, why aren't you going? 
Why, why, why are you not going? Because you well, you know us, the answer to that. Well, so you to know, answer, answer your own question. So to answer your original question, who are the most fickle fans out there? It's 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 hard to go past. Look, I think there's all a lot of supporters have this element, and a lot of clubs have this element. If you if you're going poorly, there's a natural drop, drop off. off they drop not off to quickly. this, surely not to this extreme. Though. Well, not when you have. 92,000 for Dusty's 300th in the same year and you've dropped off to, and look, it's, it's a Sunday game. It's in the middle of the day. There's not really any excuses. Oh, it's wet and it's cold no, and but all there, that. There's not, there's not those excuses like there would be, I, I don't know, say for a Sunday twilight or an early Saturday game where you're competing with with school sport. So if you're a Richmond fan, why, why aren't you going? 0433981116 and, and, and I always get um, criticised for playing at a Port Adelaide side where we needed tarps at uh, at Footy Park, but I, I don't reckon we really ever got to nineteen thousand. And when you're in a hundred thousand seat stadium, m- maybe Richmond need to bring the tarps. <laughs> the old tarps. They, they make me laugh every well, time the tarps. So why? What? I know I said this about the Port Adelaide Curtain. fans. It, it it annoys me that one week you can turn up and boo the coach, and you're there and you think yeah. you're a real hero booing the coach when you're in the footy. And then the following week, the next home game, you're there cheering. Yes, how good is this, Port Adelaide? So what, they rock up this week against Richmond and boo? Like, it's it's embarrassing. And and I think Richmond fans would be themselves as they reflect on this crowd and the concerns that he's going to be ongoing for the for the footy club with the with the pain that they're going to go through in the next five years, that there's 19,000 there on a, on a Sunday afternoon.